So absolutely, like China's the ultimate goal and Russia's sort of like a practice run. And it's so frightening mm -hmm. because you have two nuclear armed countries and you actually have articles in like the Washington Post. I think like Josh Rogan wrote this article a few months ago and it was like, yes, we can take on China and Russia at the same time. And These it's a people, common people like I don't know who Josh Rogan is, but shame on that person for saying things like that. Like a neoconservative. For, just, just for trotting out those ideas. What the fuck is wrong with people for yeah. saying things like that? Is that what you want? A two front war with Russia and China? It's crazy. It's actually crazy. And it's like, I don't know if these people have like, are like pro apocalypse. I'm not sure. I mean, they really just believe in like US uh, hegemony to the point where they're like, no, 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 we'll like always win. But we'll they could, the US military couldn't meet the Taliban in <laughs> Afghanistan. How right. the fuck are they going to beat China? Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. In the first few months of the war in Ukraine, we heard a lot about the foreign legion of volunteers from around the world who flocked to the country to join the fight against Russia at the explicit invitation of Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Tens of thousands from over 50 countries were reported to have made the journey, but that has since fallen out of the headlines. So what happened to these foreign fighters? Did they all go home? Or maybe it was a media sideshow meant to drum up international support for the war. Or perhaps their existence isn't useful for Western narratives, given the controversial nature of foreigners joining a war effort that includes, at least at the margins, white supremacists and neo-Nazis. For the foreign fighters who did go and stay in Ukraine, what might the blowback be? Is it possible Ukraine could become the neo-Nazi version of what Afghanistan was for the jihadi movement in the 1980s or Syria after 2011? What are the parallels between Syria and Ukraine? And where does the Cold War on China fit into it? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by investigative journalist Seth Harp, a contributing editor for Rolling Stone and author of the forthcoming book, The Delta Force Murders, which will be published by Viking Press. But before we jump into it, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can help it grow by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash breakthrough news or by donating below on YouTube. Seth, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's so good to have you on. I'm really excited to ha talk about this topic. Um, you actually last year spent some time in Ukraine kind of mm. following these foreign fighters that we're going to be talking about. Um, and I think it's, it's so interesting how in the first few months of the war, we heard a lot about the foreign legion of volunteers from around the world, right? Who went to join the fight against Russia. I mean, there was like an art, there was like 10 articles a day about it. Uh, and you actually talk about, I think in your Harper's piece, which I'll link to in the description of this episode, you actually kind of talk about how it was a little bit almost humorous the way that like every media outlet was there just like constantly talking to these people. But of course that whole story has since fallen out of the headlines. We don't hear so much any more about the foreign legion or these foreign fighters. Um, although the International Legion still does have a Facebook page that's quite active. But I guess, you know, a good place to start would be, <laughs> since you wrote a pretty in-depth piece about this, what is the International Legion in Ukraine? Does it even still matter anymore? Is like, what's what's going on with these foreign fighters? Um, you know, the International Legion isn't a, like a coherent, discrete military unit. Um, you know, with a commander and a, and a chain of command and a base uh, that, that you can visit. It's more of like a concept. It's more of an idea. Um, it's an open invitation for war tourists of all stripes uh, to come to Ukraine um, and in some cases fight. Uh, you know, you mentioned that there had been a ton of news articles, um, but uh, they're still, I mean, they're still getting pushed out. Like there was just a few in uh, Vice and a few in, or there was one in Esquire recently. So Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of, it's another way. I think the most important thing or the most significant uh, thing that the International Legion is, is a sort of um, way to turn out these articles and to uh, generate um, Western affinity for the for the Ukrainian military cause, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does seem like and you and you note that like you actually like went to, you went to Kiev, you didn't just stay sort of like on the border with Poland, like a lot of people did. And you went and tried to make meet with these people and you actually had a difficult time finding anybody who was actually on the front line. It did seem much more to be like a propagandistic uh, attempt to generate international support with the war. But of course that doesn't mean that people didn't go, like people did go. There was a few different kinds of people. 
there seemed to be like almost like a few categories of the type of person uh, that tried to go join the fight in Ukraine. Like some of them were just sort of online losers, <laughs> it seems, who wanted to, you know, who wanted some cause to be a part of who maybe play too many video games. There also was like a bunch of military veterans who wanted to go and, you know, fight for freedom or some like abstract concept that I'm not sure they quite understood what they were going to do. And that is, of course, the kind of people that the Ukrainians did want. If anybody was going to come, they wanted people with actual combat experience. Uh, and then there's, of course, like another category of people that maybe went for like ideological, like right wing reasons. But I guess before we get into those sort of specifics, have you stayed in touch with any of the people that you met last year just to see, you know, where they're at now, if they're still in Ukraine or like what transpired after they attempted to join the Ukrainian armed forces? Um, there was one guy that I remained in, in contact with, uh, a guy named Tristan Nettles, who was interestingly had gone to Ukraine for a very specific purpose of raising awareness for a, uh, a young woman who had gotten thrown in jail in Thailand um, on his account. It's a very bizarre story. It has really nothing to do with what we're talking about. But he saw it as this is just he was a Marine veteran. He saw this Ukrainian foreign Asian thing and all the media surrounding it as a way to like raise awareness of this young woman's plight. Um, so I've stayed in touch with him. And actually, he was a very experienced combat veteran. And mm. he sent me some photos um, of him and some a, a unit uh, of guys that he served with all Western, all US and uh, British veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, you know, I gathered from, from some of the stuff that he sent me and from talking to him that those guys really were in the fight. Uh, but I think they were definitely the exception for the most part. These are just war tourists knocking around Lviv and, and Kyiv and elsewhere. They're welcome to be there uh, by the government. They're great for propaganda purposes, uh, like I said, but um, they're certainly not having a significant uh, impact on the, on the outcome of any battles. Right. Um, and then, of course, there was this other category. Well, there were some people, I, maybe this is the kind of war tourist type of person that you're talking about, uh, the sorts of people that you spoke to last year. And we saw also like them online on Reddit complaining that the Ukrainians were using foreigners as cannon fodder. The word cannon fodder kept coming up, like basically just like throwing their bodies at Russians um, and, you know, just using them as like people who would easily like get, take a gun, not be well equipped and just go to the front lines to die. How true was that narrative from your understanding versus like, not, rather than just being people complaining because it was really, war was harder than they thought. <laughs> it's, it's not true. They weren't being used as cannon fodder. I mean, the Ukrainian army are being used as cannon fodder. The Ukrainian army are dying. You know, men in the Ukrainian army are dying at a rate of like a hundred a day. Absolutely horrifying. Uh, and they really kept a lid on the extent of the casualties, but th those are the those are the cannon fodder. I mean, we don't know how many uh, United States citizens and, and British citizens have died fighting in Ukraine. Uh, our State Department um, knows uh, how many confirmed deaths there have been over there, but won't won't uh, make that information public. I've asked them, um, but I think that it's probably not that many, or else word would have gotten out, tripled out. I think the last count I saw was maybe a dozen. Uh, U.S. citizens killed so far, which in the grand scheme of things is not that significant. You know, there were a lot more that were killed in Syria. In fact, the, I actually covered the foreign fighters uh, in Syria before this war in Ukraine, uh, which is why Harper's asked me to, to go over there when it, when it popped off. And um, I think it would be interesting to maybe talk about some of the differences there because it, I definitely, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's no, that's, that's actually, actually like a really important uh, comparison. There may be some parallels and many, many differences. Uh, and I do want to get into that, but I guess before, before we do get there, I mean, I just wanted to kind of like pick up on something that you said, which is that the state department has been very tight lipped about, uh, any Americans who have died. And also, you know, there, there have been a few instances where someone has died and their family has talked to like local press in the U S mm -hmm. and it's also just like really a few of those stories have been very strange. Like there was maybe a little bit more to the story than we know, um, mm -hmm. in some cases I suspect, I have no proof of this, but in some cases I suspect that perhaps a couple of these people were there actually in some sort of special operations capacity or some sort of like advisory role, actually like working for some arm of the Pentagon or the U S government in some way, which would make sense that that would be happening, 
uh, on some level in Ukraine. And there's also been a couple stories that seem like, was this person a mercenary? Like you hear what their family says, you hear what the State Department says, and it's just like, mm -hmm. but we don't know. We, the, yeah. the, the answer is we don't know. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Uh, well, I know that two, two uh, stars were added to the CIA's wall uh, back in May of last year, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, and the timing of that, of course, we don't know, but the timing of that, I would guess, um, strongly suggests to me that those guys died in Ukraine and were either members of the Special Activities Center or some other uh, covert paramilitary arm. Um, you know, we know that JSOC is in, is in Ukraine. They have been since the very beginning of the war, contrary to the um, statements of U.S. officials at the highest level. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's how covert action works. They deny it, of course. Um, I think that those guys probably uh, are not um, the casualties that we're seeing from, from uh, you know, you're mentioning local, local uh, news reports on like family members who have had people killed over there. I think that uh, those guys probably are able to keep themselves out of um, situations where they're likely to get killed. It's not the it's not the case that that the U.S. would send like Team Six operators to be fighting on the front lines. That's just not um, that wouldn't be an effective use of those of those guys. I think they would be there for much more specific, limited purposes, and they would be under strict instructions to like keep away from active fighting because, you know, w what good is it going to be for anybody if some Delta Force guy gets killed over? It? In, in Ukraine, that's just going to be bad uh, for, for the U.S. So I think there's certainly a lot of, um, you know, U.S. personnel over there. But, uh, you know, whether they're actively taking part in the fighting, I don't I don't know that that's that's happening at all. Yeah. And of course, like there's so much investment and training that goes into people who are like Delta Force or Navy SEALs, all these kinds of people that you're not going to want to just like put them on the front lines of a situation where you've got, like you said, I think it was even more at one point that the Ukrainians admitted were dying a day. Um, that would be a massive waste of money and time. But you, I think it's also really interesting that you you met with the founder of the Azov Battalion um, mm -hmm. yeah. in Kiev last April. So I'm curious, can you just like briefly explain, because we've heard so much about the Azov Battalion, what is it exactly? Are these neo-Nazis? Uh, or are they a mix of things? How integrated are they actually in the Ukrainian armed forces? And from your time with them, do they have any foreign fighters that you know of? They absolutely have foreign fighters. They have plenty of foreign fighters. I don't know that there's that many uh, Americans or British guys in the Azov Battalion. They are uh, media savvy enough to, to know that they need to, to not allow Americans to, to join. Um, you know, Andrew Bolesky and also one of his top uh, commanders, um, Maxime Zorin, told me that or I talked to them and, you know, it was clear that they um, were at pains to present themselves as, uh, you know, they didn't use the word de-radicalized, but that was clearly um, what they were going for, trying to make them, you know, their beliefs seem to be less, uh, you know, distasteful from a sort of Western liberal perspective. Um, I'm not sure that the every time I hear the word Nazi, I kind of uh, or neo-Nazi, I kind of uh, I don't know, shut down mentally in a way. I just don't find it to be the most helpful term. Like you, we hear a lot of that to denigrate the to the Ukrainian armed forces because they're super right wing, or the elements of the Ukrainian armed forces that are super right wing. Um, and that's just the term is so harsh that I'm just not sure it adds anything, especially because it gets thrown around on both sides. Like the, the World War II was 100, almost 100 years ago, 80 years ago. Um, I think it'd be, it's better to call them ultra nationalists and it, explore exactly what it is that they believe. Because, for example, Ukraine in the, in the United States or in other Western countries, a lot of the far right is oriented around basically racist or anti-immigrant beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I don't think that plays such a, an important role in, in Ukrainian politics because uh, they have so few minorities in that country. Right. It's like it's a, a homogenous society. Extremely yeah. homogenous. It's actually pretty shocking to come from the United States. And, I'm, you know, I'm from Texas, it's highly diverse. To go to Ukraine and see this, like, wow, well, every single person around here is white. Yeah. Um, and um, I think it's more helpful to talk about, uh, you know, what, what it is that they actually believe in. And, you know, one of the questions I asked uh, Bilecki was whether they believe in democracy, for example, because we're constantly hearing that Ukraine is at the forefront of the global fight for democracy against authoritarianism. And they were pretty frank and, you know, and saying that they don't they don't believe in elections they don't believe in the democratic process you know that's not what they're about you know they they subscribe more to this ideal uh, this kind of like Nietzschean ideal of a strong leader who rises to the forefront of society as a result of his uh, 
uh, charisma and, um, you know, prowess in battle, actually. So I think uh, rather than, you know, just calling them neo-Nazis or whatever, or skinheads, uh, uh, I mean, you could if you want to. I mean, they cer certainly are susceptible to that. The, you, if you go there, I mean, when I was in the Aslov Battalion's headquarters, you could see like this giant wolf's angle flag. All the aesthetics are very much like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the guy who was my driver who drove me up to the uh, base, he had on his knuckles, it was tattooed hate, H-A-T-E. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's pretty on the nose. <laughs> Um, that's actually wild <laughs> just yeah. to have sorry, I, was, I probably I probably shouldn't be laughing but that just sounds cartoonish like it, it, hate it, yeah, yeah but look I mean the the issue with you know, Ukraine's the overarching ideology in Ukraine is not um, some kind of ultra nationalist or, or, or neo-nazi thing I mean very, it's very obvious that you know that that the, sig the significant ideological uh, paradigm there is Western neoliberal capitalism and being part of the NATO EU world order. They wouldn't even be permitted to, to um, step out of line of, of those parameters, basically. So um, now what was your question again? I'm sorry. I started oh, I was just about to ask. I was just curious about the Azov battalion, you know, and like your, your experience meeting with this leader. I mean, I do think like what you're saying makes total sense. I also don't think that these things are mutually exclusive. I mean, that's like a basically a different discussion, but in terms of like, neoliberal capitalism and NATO and all these things. Like, I don't think that and far right ultranationalist neo-Nazi sentiments are necessarily mutually exclusive. I mean, there can be anti-NATO neo-Nazis, which do exist in some countries. <laughs> and then there can be pro-NATO ones. And of course, NATO has a very interesting, rich history of, um, of being, uh, of, of having participants in it, especially during its founding who were former Nazis. So, I mean, there's, it's mm -hmm. like, it's not, it's, it's, so I think, I think the more interesting thing here when it comes to what's happening in Ukraine and a lot of countries around Ukraine is that ultra nationalism in these places historically, and even today can easily become, um, maybe because these societies are so homogenous and just the histories that they have can easily become Nazi friendly. Um, but I mean, that's a, that's a discussion for, for a different day, but I do think that, you know, after a year of this war, we do still see like the Western media, you know, whitewashing the role of whatever you want to call them far right elements, neo-Nazis, white supremacists in Ukraine. I mean, of course, on the other side of it, you have Russia saying like all of Ukraine is, you know, neo-Nazis, which isn't true either. So, so <laughs> what, what I'll say is that those elements absolutely exist. They are very far right. Their beliefs uh, would be abhorrent to the uh, sort of Western liberal perspective. The media does whitewash their existence. If they were part of the U.S. military, they would be, you know, if one guy with like a three percenters tattoo on his ankle <laughs> points the 100, the 100 right. Airborne Division, it's literally on the front page of like, you know, ABC News and even, even the New York Times covers some things like that at times. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and over there, it's just the far, far more of a significant part of their society. Um, but it's not the majority. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's it's not to it's not to justify or apologize in any way for some for a group like the Azov Battalion or even more extreme elements over there, like the misanthropic division, which I've covered. Um, right. But, which yeah. I actually was a little I wanted to ask you about that division. I don't know if you could elaborate a little bit on the misanthropic division. What an but, interesting name. <laughs> well, the misanthropic division is a lot like the, the International Legion itself in the sense that it's not really a unit. It's just sort of like an idea. It's sort of like a, a sort of online click that anybody can claim. Um, and uh, it's hard to explain exactly what they're about, um, except that they are they really are neo-nazis yeah okay i mean i guess it's not that hard to explain if you can jump on the <laughs> telegram channel it's just full of it's full yeah. of the most egregious hate uh, that you can imagine but look any armed conflict in the world like these groups are going to proliferate these kind of subcultures exactly. are going to exist you're going to find lots of uh detestable elements you know talking about in syria as well the u.s funded and supported groups um i, I think it was probably worse a lot worse in syria uh the groups Definitely. that got funding there because look I don't think the Azov Battalion or the Misanthropic Division are ever going to do like terrorist attacks in Europe or, or the United States. Now, I can't say that about groups that the U.S. funded in Syria. Unfortunately, uh, there was a lot of overlap there. Um, my concern with Ukraine and the reason why I'm not a supporter of U.S. involvement in Ukraine is because of the risk of a conflagration and the risk of a, a, a wider war with Russia and potentially catastrophic nuclear war uh, with Russia. That's the issue. I think in Ukraine that, that we should be laser focused on. It is of course embarrassing uh, to Western sponsors 
of the Ukrainian cause and that so much of their money, training, arms and stuff is going to groups like Azov Battalion when you have, you know, like Biden marching arm in arm with civil rights leaders in Selma uh, on the one hand. And then, you know, the, the, on the other hand, they're sending a hundred billion dollars in military aid, you know, much of which is going to groups like this. Um, but it's really not the key issue. The key issue is that our, um, our government uh, on autopilot to generate conflict uh, because of uh, it's because it's enthralled to the military industrial complex, constantly pushing for more regime change, constantly trying to topple any kind of uh, government that, that steps out of line or that poses a threat to, uh, you know, the liberal Western liberal hegemony in Eastern Europe or in Asia. Uh, and basically the uh, teleology of both major parties being war with Russia and China, global war with Russia and China at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's what they're all pushing for. And it's absolutely insane. I have a lot of sources in the, in the military that talk to me all the time. I was just talking to a, a young woman who's a Marine officer the other day who's going, about to go to the Philippines uh, for some drill. And, you know, they all say the same thing, all of them. It's actually, it's kind of interesting how little they talk about Ukraine. People in the U.S. military are not that, are not that concerned with Ukraine. It's really because it's uh, uh, just a smaller uh, uh, slice of the pie, so to speak. What they're all focused on is war with China. That is what the machine is gearing up uh, to do. And you can see... Um, indications of that all over the place in the, in the media and things that politicians are saying and so forth. That's what they're all gearing towards. So I don't know. What do you think about that? What do you think about the prospect of possible? <laughs> no, 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 no. I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, even the way that we hear U S officials talk about the war in Ukraine, it's like, it's this, they, they're constantly making these parallels to China, to Taiwan, to, we should be using the Ukraine playbook in Taiwan. Ukraine is like a practice round for what's ultimately going to happen with China. And at the end of the day, I mean, yes, Russia is like a thorn in the side of the U.S. because it doesn't get in line in so many ways. But at the same time, Russia is still kind of like it's a relatively powerful country, but it's also quite weak as a country, whereas China is, of course, in any, you know, you, the Pentagon white paper in any national security paper, the ultimate goal is to you know, to, to beat China because China might, China might over, you know, overcome our economy in 10 years or 15 years if they haven't already. And just all the ways we can do that. So oh. absolutely. Like China's the ultimate goal and Russia sort of like a practice run. And it's so frightening mm -hmm. because you have two nuclear armed countries and you actually have articles in like the Washington post. I think like Josh Rogan wrote this article a few months ago and it was like, yes, we can take on China and Russia at the same time. And These it's a people, common, people like yeah. I don't know who Josh Rogan is, but shame on that person for saying things like that. Like a neoconservative. For, just, just for trotting out those ideas. What the fuck is wrong with people for yeah. saying things like that? Is that what you want? A two front war with Russia and China? It's crazy. It's actually crazy. And it's like, I don't know if these people have like, are like pro apocalypse. I'm not sure. I mean, they really just believe in like US uh, hegemony to the point where they're like, no, 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 we'll like always win. But we'll they could, the US military couldn't beat the Taliban in <laughs> Afghanistan. How right. the fuck are they going to beat China? They're not. And they're here's not. what, you know, you said that, uh, sorry, I shouldn't get angry about this. No, um, I mean, it actually, people should get angrier about this because it is actually infuriating that people who are in positions of power. This is what they want and where they're headed. The, th the thing is they're on autopilot because everything is, is sort of machine oriented just towards push, creating and generating constant conflict. That's how people rise in the end of theocracy. Um, but you said a moment ago, we pointed out that Russia is a, is a weak country. I think that's an important point to focus on, the fact that Russia is a weak country because that is why we have a war in Ukraine, because of Russian weakness. Because the U.S. posed um, a dilemma to Russia that said, Either you accept a nuclear or excuse me, a, a NATO aligned Ukraine or you go to war. Mm -hmm. And because that was seen to Moscow as an existential threat, they chose war. They said, fine, war it is. And Russia did not want to go to war uh, no, they in Ukraine. Um, they, Russia is not a good regime. Putin is not a good, uh, you know, whatever, morally upstanding, whatever you want to say. It's, there's nothing, no different, difference between Putin and any other regime in the world primarily motivated by their own self-interest and secondarily motivated by their country's interest. Right. And with those interests in mind, they looked at the dilemma presented to them by the West and 20 years of NATO expansion uh, and the so, sort of increasing, uh, inching closer and closer uh, and, and said, fine, wait, the war, war it is. To them, that was the rational choice. But it was because the regime in Moscow feels threatened by um, the presence of so much... Uh, so many nuclear, or so many uh, weapons, armaments, 
and military personnel being in Ukraine. That they, they felt that that was a real threat to the regime. Um, and what gives me hope is that the Chinese probably don't feel that same sort of insecurity. Right. The U.S. is not in a position to knock over the Communist Party of China right. in the same way that we might actually be able to take out Putin, um, especially if there was a as if, if there was a massive base in Ukraine of U.S. military assets and intelligence assets. Um, and I don't think the Chinese would fight a war with the United States. It's I don't think they don't. They don't want to. They also just don't want not. to. Yeah. China definitely is not as it doesn't have the same military assertiveness that, let's say, Russia has. It, it, it's it, and also they're just not. Uh, so the U.S. Um, pushing constantly pushing for war is pathological in the sense that it's against our like real politic interests. Mm -hmm. If you're just strictly concerned, if it's, you can take morality completely out of the question. And if you're just strictly interested in the self-interest of the United States, it is against our interest to be creating these conflicts. But they still happen anyway because our government is captive to the military industrial complex, just in the same way that, um, you know, let's say a, a thriving corporation is taken over by a predatory uh, private equity company. It's in their short term interest to strip its assets away and sell it off and profit, uh, you know, the, the private equity um, uh, managers will profit from that transaction, but the corporation itself in the long term will be harmed. Yeah. So just on those strict, um, like I said, realpolitik grounds, it's against our self-interest to be pushing for these wars. They happen anyway because our government is captive. That's not the same. That's not true of Beijing. Um, and so for that reason, they don't want a war. And it's interesting. You will never find it's so easy to find our politicians talking shit about China. Uh, any day you want to turn on the television, you'll find them up there. China this and China that and how horrible China is and how they're killing their own people and all this other stuff. I've never seen a clip in my life. Obviously, I don't speak Chinese, but I've never seen it or Mandarin. I've never seen a clip in my life of like a Chinese politician talking about the United States and how we're such an evil country and we have such bad government. Right. And how we're doing all these atrocities. Like they're just not antagonistic towards us in the same way. And I think even the Taiwanese at this point would look at... Um, you know, the, the, the lay of the land, so to speak. And if you're in Taiwan, who are you better off aligning yourself with at this point in 2023 with Beijing or with the United States? Do you want to become Ukraine? Do the Taiwanese want their country to be like Ukraine? I hope not. I hope this, not. <laughs> yeah, a war zone that, that, that smolders for 30 years. Yeah. I mean, I think that's also like a really, just to go back to Ukraine for a moment. I mean, you were talking about what war does to a place and how it kind of brings out like, the worst kinds of people, which is true anywhere. I mean, militias and gangs and just like the worst kinds of person, people in society uh, are empowered in wars because of like the vacuums and authority and like order that it causes. Um, and you definitely saw that in Syria uh, to a way greater degree where you had like all these like sort of Gulf states, various Middle Eastern oligarchs and then Western countries, like just throwing money and weapons into this place. And in some cases like funding a gang on this street and a gang on that street named after this guy who funded it or that guy who funded it. I mean, it was just a complete disaster. And ultimately it ends up destroying the country. And I just wanted to quote you because you wrote in the intercept in a report last year, you said radical miscreants from all over the world who subscribe to the blood and soil ideology of neo-Nazi subcultures have a very real opportunity to travel to Ukraine, get military training and participate in intense armed conflict against a technologically advanced enemy. If they survive, their combat experience could give them the confidence and ability to carry out acts of political violence in their home countries. This is clearly cause for concern at a time when incidents of hate crimes and domestic terrorism are on the rise. I thought that was a really good point you made, and I know you're kind of saying you're not so worried about that with the people in Ukraine, and it definitely was worse in Syria. I mean, we saw how this became a real threat with Syria because of just people from everywhere in the world traveled to Syria to go join like Nusra or ISIS or, mm -hmm. you know, Harar al-Sham or like, mm -hmm. you know, whatever these collection of various jihadist groups who were trying to topple, topple the Syrian government. Um, right. And then people would go back to like France or in some cases they wouldn't even have gone to Syria. They would just like be, you know, inspired and motivated by, by the people in Syria online to like commit some, you know, act of violence in mm -hmm. their home countries. And I mean, maybe, you know, yeah, Ukraine is different. It's not as many foreign fighters. It's certainly mostly Ukrainians dying. However, um, 
there is still like an inter a problem internationally with a rising far right that even our own you know american intelligence agencies warn are increasingly dangerous mm -hmm. uh and you know future terrorist attacks and also a lot of recent ones in the last few years mm -hmm. are more likely to come from far right individuals uh oh, for sure and even like islamic ex terrorism at this point so you know and not just i guess I'm, I'm my question for you is how much of a threat do these foreign fighters pose to their countries of origin and then beyond that what about the inspiration it may give to the far right across europe across the US and other parts of the global North that may be looking at Ukraine and they really do see Ukraine as this like, mm -hmm. you know, sort of, oh, like that's the whites getting their way or whatever ideology they're <laughs> motivated by from there. But like, what what's the threat level do you think from these kinds of people? Uh, good question, a lot going on there. I mean, I am worried about it. You know, you, the piece you quoted, I wrote it right there. Um, and it's true that, that we see uh, these domestic terrorist attacks taking place. Um, and I think it is a real, a, a real problem. It's just that I'm more worried about our State Department and CIA and and all the, and all the other agencies of the U.S. government and things that they're doing. I'm much more worried about the violence that they're perpetrating in the world, yeah, uh, than these radical miscreants. Um, to you know, to answer your or to respond to what you said about the far right seeing Ukraine as an inspiration. Um, fortunately, they're kind of scrambled, I think, in their view of it. Ukraine is not a far right cause, uh, um, unambiguously. I mean, some people you can find it there, but but others, you know, look at Russia and see yeah. Russia as the as the uh, you know the the paradigm for rejection of global global homo or whatever they call it. Uh, you know, the sort of globalist uh, liberal ideals, and, and you'll see a lot of in these in these um, in these Telegram channels, you'll see a lot of. Um, denigration of the Ukrainians with like rainbow flags and things like that, and other other ways to like tar them um, with the symbology of this of what they see as a sort of degenerate uh, Western liberal order. So, fortunately, there's not like a clear cut um, cause for them there over in Ukraine. And, and like I said, I'm more I am concerned about that. Uh, it, it 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 should give us pause. But you know, another thing is that you you really don't need. <laughs> A whole lot of expertise or training sadly to be, to become a terrorist um or to do a mass shooting we see them in the united yeah. states all the time That's um true. maybe the one thing that you do gain from being in in combat is uh, i guess like uh, a sort of lowered threshold of willingness to to you know, pull the trigger because yeah. you you're just sort of um used to hearing gunfire and explosions and stuff and you're you're not quite as uh, timid about it, but uh, other than that, like, I mean, people who want to do those kind of attacks are going to do them anyway. They don't need necessarily to go to, to Ukraine and get, and get training for it. Like I said, I'm more concerned about what our, our actual government is doing over there. And then to go back to the, the Syria sort of parallel, and I do want to get a bit more into that, but I thought it was interesting. I mean, you also reported, and I'm quoting you again, that uh, uh, talking about some of the foreign fighters that you met. Many were combat veterans or had military training. Some had fought the Islamic State in Syria with the Kurdish militia known as the YPG. Um, and then you went on to say a few had already seen action in Ukraine's Donbass region where war with Russia backed separatists had smoldered since 2014. That stood out to me because, you know, there were a couple other pieces I read around the same time that you wrote yours um, highlighting a person here or there who had fought with the YPG. And you actually, you like you mentioned, you spent time reporting on Syria. You actually did report on those foreigners who joined the the anti ISIS fight with with YPG. So I don't know. I'm kind of curious if you can like give us a psychological breakdown of what that person is all about. It just it always seemed so odd to me um, that there was there are people who will like go around the world and join fights that aren't really theirs. I mean, whatever you want to go fight ISIS, go fight ISIS. <laughs> Good for you. But I always yeah. just found a lot of those people to be a bit. But when I read about them, to be a bit odd. So. You know, I, I have kind of a soft spot for people that are that uh, nutty. Um, <laughs> and I definitely portrayed the YPG volunteers in a sympathetic way when I was reporting on them. And I still do feel sympathetic towards them. I think the big difference between them and Ukraine is that the volunteers who fought with the YPG, it was kind of, or it really was an organic phenomenon. And it wasn't in service of US-backed regime change um, or, or a US-backed war. You know, the, of course, the war in Syria was the result of those kind of machinations. 
Um, however, the Kurds were kind of caught in the middle of it and opportunistically carved out their own space in Syria in order to um, implement their ideology, which is, uh, which is unusually for the Middle East, a sort of anarcho-feminism, I would describe it. <laughs> it sounds like, looks like you're familiar yeah. more or less with Abdullah Ocalan and those guys. Yeah. So there was this thing in sort of internet subculture, the Rojava revolution in 2015, 2016, where everyone was going to, it was almost like the sort of ad busters type of uh, aesthetics. Uh, where <laughs> it was like, grab your laptop and come to Rojava and we're going to plant some potatoes in the rubble and create <laughs> a new world. Right. And it was cool. Honestly, it was kind of cool um, because how can you fault like the Kurds for trying to defend themselves? Later, it became very complicated um, by the presence of JSOC in Syria and the presence of U.S. commandos um, and basically using the Syrian Kurds as a proxy force. So it got a little bit less, um, you know, glamorous. Got, yeah, that's a one way I'm searching for the right word. But yeah, sure. Glamorous. It got less of less. Of, it got a little bit more complicated. A little bit more serious, a little bit more real. Yeah. But at first it was, um, you know, people going over for that, there for that reason. And there was no like organized recruiting going on. There was one sort of janky website called the, uh, the Rojava plan, <laughs> you know, where you could, <laughs> yeah, where you could, uh, where you could sort of um, get in contact, get an email address with, with like the one person in the, in the YPG who spoke um, 10 words of English. And it would help you yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the, as a result of that, that uh, you know, the sort of, I would say, positive portrayals of um, the Western volunteers over in Syria, in the press, that very much influenced what happened in Ukraine at the beginning mm -hmm. of 2022, because, you know, there is a ton mm -hmm. of investment by U.S. Uh, government-backed NGOs in Ukraine, uh, many of which are very much oriented towards the media and journalism space. Um, and there are a lot of uh, Western media advisors to the Ukrainian government. And so, of course, I wasn't part of the behind the scenes, uh, whatever was going on, but clearly they had a sort of organized idea of what they were going to do and rolled out this uh, Ukrainian foreign legion thing in an extremely splashy way, literally a speech from the president Zelensky coming on TV and saying, we invite everyone in the world who wants to fight Russia to come to Ukraine here's our website, the Ukrainian Foreign Legion, here's how to get in touch with us, here's how to join. Um, and so it was a much bigger and much more organized uh, thing. And, um, you know, the, I think the big difference other than that is that people are going over there to fight, uh, not in service of, of some kind of organic self-defense uprising, like we saw with the Syrian Kurds, but rather in service of the war between, uh, the proxy war between the U.S., uh, and Russia, which is a, a very different uh, kettle of fish. Right. And I'm just curious your um, thoughts on who is winning in Ukraine or if anyone's winning or what winning even means at this point. I've seen that you, you've, you've basically characterized this as like a frozen, as a mm -hmm. frozen conflict. Yeah. You know, I would, I would guess that the Ukrainians are doing a lot less uh, well than we're told. Mm -hmm. But I don't really have insight into that because they've done such a good job of hiding the casualty numbers. All we can see is that, yeah, like you said, the battle lines are are frozen. And um, the and the country is just like it's the country is like irreparably shattered for the for like the, for like an indefinite period of time. I mean, forever probably. Yeah, yeah forever. Just like in Syria, Libya, Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, Mali every other site of U.S. regime change, your country is fucked forever if you allow this to take place. Yeah. That's what people in countries like Taiwan should know. Do you think you're going to become a Western liberal democracy if you side, you know, with the CIA-backed faction? That's not going to happen. Look at Libya. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at Iraq. Look mm -hmm. at Syria. I mean, Syria is like chopped up and a complete disaster and... Mm -hmm. Then there's also sanctions. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I actually saw recently you were trying to make some points about Syria and you got into it on Twitter. <laughs> um, I, I, me, I, <laughs> you, I mean, it, it was a couple of weeks ago um, okay. and it was about the idea that U.S. policy essentially 
created ISIS. Oh, um, okay, yeah. Which is not inaccurate at all. Um, yeah. It's uh, pretty straightforward, actually. And even people in the US government know that and are aware of that and have said so, at least privately and then sometimes publicly. Um, well, the, I'm sorry, were you about to ask a question? Well, I was just going to say, I, I just, I think it's like when we talk about blowback and maybe with Ukraine, we, you know, one of the biggest issues with Ukraine is obviously the stakes are so much higher than Syria, right? Because the stakes are like potential nuclear war, yeah, which is right. over for the world. So it's that's just, a way bigger mm -hmm. deal than just destroying one country or maybe having like decades of blowback from various extremists who got their start in Syria in this case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um but I'm just like, I, I just think it's worth rehashing what happened in Syria because Syria, in my mm -hmm. opinion, at least, and you can feel free to disagree with me here, but U.S. policy in Syria, obviously, like the rise of ISIS also had to do with U.S. policy in Iraq. But in terms of like the rise of ISIS and all of these various Al Qaeda groups and the, just the complete destabilization of this region mm -hmm. caused so much blowback in various forms, whether we're talking about you know, people going, you know, foreign fighters going to these places and then leaving and then going and like doing destructive things in their or countries of origin, which mm -hmm. happened quite a bit not too many years ago, or whether we're talking about the fact that it destabilized such a huge region of the Middle East that it caused this like refugee crisis that literally changed the politics of Europe. Um, I think that argument could be made that the the politics of Europe actually, be actually became more right wing. Um, as Absolutely. a result of like the influx of refugees from Syria, from Libya, from all of these places where people were just fleeing disasters that Western policies played a huge role in causing. Um, yeah. And I mean, in the case of Syria, I think that was also a place where the Russians and the Americans got into it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you could almost say that that was like a practice round for Ukraine in a way, uh, in terms yeah. of like a proxy war with Russia. But I'm just curious your thoughts reflecting on Syria. Um, and what we haven't learned from that war. Um, well, you know, the idea that the United, the U.S. did create ISIS. The U.S. also created Al Qaeda. Yeah. And I don't mean that in the sense that people, you know, in the you live in in Lebanon, um, so you're well aware that people across the Middle East actually think that that um, groups like ISIS are U.S. creations. We're like They're, trained by the Pentagon. They actually, sure, yeah. Yeah. a lot of people yeah. believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's mainstream view. And yeah. It's also a mainstream view in like Latin America as well. Um, I don't think that, like, I don't, like, let me be clear about that. Like, I, I don't think that, but I can understand why yeah. so many people think that well, in these I, countries, right? Like it's, it's, it's <laughs> actually not necessary to believe that, right? Because if you go back, you can trace it from the very beginning, starting with operation cyclone in Afghanistan, which of course raised, uh, Al Qaeda to prominence, which created Al Qaeda, which, which, uh, created bin Laden as a sort of person in the world. That's how he first came to prominence as an enabler of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And that trend just uh, of blowback just keeps going on and on. And in, in Syria and in Iraq where ISIS first emerged, uh, it's interesting there was a, so the first leader, the first real leader of, um, of what became ISIS was a guy named Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who was actually, he was living in Northern um, Iraq uh, doing something. I think he was just like a smuggler. He's like a Jordanian smuggler. I don't know the whole backstory, but he was featured in one of the most egregious pieces of, uh, of, uh, of propaganda this, of, for the sort of uh, WND Al Qaeda conspiracy theory. This um, infamous profile in the New Yorker, it's infamous article in the New Yorker, which portrayed uh, Al Zarqawi as a kind of a link between Saddam and Al Qaeda, right. which he wasn't. But interestingly uh, and ironically, he kind of looked around at the beginning of the war and was everyone thinks I'm this big bad jihadist. I'm actually going to do that. I'm actually, and he actually did become that. He actually became like a major jihadist figure in the insurgency against the United States in Iraq and created the group that became Al Qaeda in Iraq. Of course, he was killed in 2006, but the but the group remained. Uh, it was a it was a hardcore Sunni Salafist group in Iraq. Uh, that fought the U.S. up right up until it withdrew in, in 2011, uh, and then went over into Syria uh, and was fighting the Assad regime over there because, of course, Assad is Shia as well, uh, just like Maliki and the Iraqi government that we set up. Uh, and of course, if I didn't already say this, uh, people aren't tracking um, the Zarqawi and his group were Sunni, 
and there's a there's a distinct well, just to, just to, just to correct uh asad is alawi but did they, they uh, okay. is seen as, well like uh, it's i i don't know if alawi is an offshoot of shia but certainly seen as just as much as like a through a sectarian you know sunni supremacist lens as any shia leader would be seen by zarqawi for, for, for his forgive friends. me yeah my understanding of this is, of these factions is not that sophisticated <laughs> i really only but the, but, but the, general, the, general premise, yeah. the general premise is correct yes <laughs> well in any event the, these groups were pretty marginal um after the after the withdrawal of the us in 2011 pretty marginal now I think the big thing that, that happened, the big change that happened was what's called Operation Timber Sycamore uh, and a massive uh, investment of, of CIA. Because, you know, people think that, uh, I don't know what people think of the CIA, but the CIA is primarily is an arms trafficking organization. <laughs> that's uh, a good way to describe that's the, it. That's the main thing that they do. If you read the memoirs of like CIA officers who have had a prominent role uh, in world events, like Michael Vickers, I'm just reading his memoir. They talk constantly or continuously about, you know, the types of guns and armaments and all these other things that they're shipping over there. Uh, that's what they do. And that's what they did in Syria. That was the plan. There's also a sort of training element. Usually the training is, is less significant. Uh, you know, they'll have Green Berets come and, and, and teach you how to uh, shoot and how to close with a target, and how to clear a building, things like that. Um, helpful skills. But for the most part, they're just giving people um, money guns, ammunition, uh, and other, you know, other armaments. Um, and that's what they did in Syria. They flooded the country with weapons and all of those went to the Sunni, the Sunni uh, side of the civil war in Syria, which of course included, uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq, now, or excuse me, uh, what did they call it? It was called the Islamic state, uh, initially Iraq. the Islamic state Islam in Iraq, right? And First it was Al Qaeda in Iraq, then the Islamic exactly. state in Iraq and Syria. I don't know. They changed yeah. their names a few times. And then of course, like ISIS. Uh, Muhammad uh, Al Jalani came. He was like uh, basically like sent as um, by Al Qaeda in Iraq to go like be their guy in Syria, and then he broke off of ISIS and formed mm -hmm. Nusra because they just disagreed on certain strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, and now he's in charge of Idlib, basically, because <laughs> um, they've changed their name now to Hayat Tahrir al Sham, mm -hmm. HTS, and Idlib. But they also kind of like operate under the authority of the Turks. It's a <laughs> So, it's a mess. yes, I, I mean, I may be I'll probably be long winded about it. But the point is, if you subtract U.S. intervention from this picture, no Al Qaeda, no ISIS. So in that sense, we did create these groups. And so God knows what is going to emerge. from. Ukraine. Absolutely. And it was so yeah. wild, too, when when ISIS did take like they swept through areas of Syria and then they took over Mosul and back in 2014. And that was like, of course, initially, if you go back and look at news reports from 2014, initially they were like, Sunni rebels take over Mosul like that's how they were described initially before it was oh, really? like oh wait yeah hmm. because the U.S. was so confused on the not confused on the one hand this was good for their regime change plot in Syria because mm -hmm. the more areas I mean any area that that kicks out the regime quickly no matter who took it over was quickly taken over by the stronger groups which were ISIS and Al, in, in Al Qaeda yeah. yeah and then um in the more areas where there was vacuums um, of like authority because the regime was pushed out, the more these groups would take over because they had weapons and they were strong and powerful and really scary. Mm -hmm. um, and U.S. policy was essentially to create little vacuums across Syria. So what does that mean? Like you're you're essentially just creating a policy where you empower ISIS, and it just became so ironic when the U.S. fight in the area became an anti-ISIS fight while still trying to get rid of the Assad regime. It's like you just can't do those two things at the same time. Totally contradictory. Because... And that you, you haven't said anything about Iran. Um, right. And Iran played a huge role, actually, mm -hmm. in helping against the fight, the fight against ISIS. And then the U.S. killed the guy who was it's the international leading... terrorism to it's international terrorism to do a strike like that on a military and political leader of a country that you're not at war with outside of any battlefield outside of any battlefield in, a, in an international airport of all places of another of a third party country i mean totally it's just insane yeah so crazy. It, but um it, your point that that the u.s policy there is totally at odds and contradictory with itself um and, and of course we have said nothing about russia and turkey and the roles it's just a complete mess that will never be untangled in syria i saw that the vote there was a vote uh, i guess yesterday uh, in the withdraw. u.s congress yeah and, and they still didn't i don't know what they think they're going to accomplish over there i don't know what they think uh it's helping anything to hold down um 
you know, those provinces of, of Eastern Syria. But in any case, um, you know, you, you mentioned that I got into it. Now I remember the dispute you're talking about. And, you know, people were angry that I uh, implied that uh, CIA money created ISIS uh, in the respect that I just described, where they hugely benefited from this influx of, of arms and money too, cash. Yeah. Um, but I think the larger point was lost on the people who were attacking me, which is that the Operation Timber Sycamore failed. Assad is still in power. So what good did this program do? The most expensive CIA program in history. You're saying, or these other people are saying, people like Danny Gould, Vice News, neocons like him, are saying, oh, no, it wasn't that big of a deal to flood Syria with weapons. Really, it was fine. Okay, well, what good did it do since Assad is still in power? You didn't even get your ultimate goal. Yeah, you didn't get your ultimate goal. It's like, at the end of the day, it accomplished nothing except destroying a country, um, which, no, I mean, I guess it depends. Do you care about destroying a country? I guess these people don't. They don't care that they destroyed a country. Well, we were um, talking earlier about the conspiratorial beliefs of the people of Latin America and the Middle East. They think that that is the goal, too. Yeah, that's, I mean, and at the, at the end of the day, like the war on Syria, I don't think it's over in the sense that it's now just an economic war. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I think one of the reasons that there's so much pushback against, like, it's like, why keep what, like seven or 800 troops, however many troops there are in Syria, it's not a more than a more thousand. Than no, Do you think it's more? more? It is more. They, oh, I thought it was like under a thousand at this no, point. No, their, their numbers, they play the games with the, they play these games with the accounting. Um, they used to say it was exactly 503. The reason why they say that is because, well, the number uh, is actually capped by legislation. or It's very complex. U.S. regulation of covert action is complex. Um, but there are like uh, quotas where they're only allowed to have a certain number of troops in a certain places. Okay. Uh, and the, the number in Syria, I don't know what it is now, but for a long time, it was exactly 503. Don't ask me why they needed the extra three guys. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> um, but they have all kinds of different ways to get around it. One of which is that if someone's deployment is less than six months, then they don't count them. They're not there. They don't uh, exist. Okay. If they uh, pertain to JSOC, uh, then they don't exist. They're not there. Um, so of course, the same is true of CIA paramilitaries. But even, you know, JSOC guys are active duty military, but it's, even they don't count. Um, so I believe the true number in Syria um, – Although it fluctuates, there was a really interesting moment. I'm not sure if this general lost his job, but he was giving a press conference and he accidentally just said the number was 4,000. Wow. Um, he was just like, I'll, I'll send it, I'll find that and send it to you. It was a few years ago, but he just straight up dropped the ball right there. He just said uh, that we had 4,000 troops in Syria. Well, we know that they're, that they're occupying the most fertile and oil producing land and denying the Syrian government access to it, which is literally like starving the country of both an important food resource as well as fuel to like, I mean, Syria has a horrible electricity problem. And also, I mean, it just, Syria is a disaster. It's like, I, did an episode, you know, a couple months back with the special repertoire on unilateral course of measures who had visited Syria to like evaluate the impact of sanctions. And it's absolutely horrific. I mean, Syria used to be have one of the top, you know, medical sectors in the region. And now it's like they're, the hospitals, even public hospitals don't have 24 hour electricity. Like you can imagine what a, what a catastrophe that is when people need dialysis or surgery. I mean, water treatment facilities can't get spare parts or fuel to function. So you had a cholera outbreak. Mm -hmm. Everyone's trying to leave the country. Like people don't have fuel to put in their cars to like drive to school. It's just, it's a complete disaster. And I imagine that's probably the reason that they want to continue to maintain a presence there is, is to make sure that Syria suffers for not like losing, I guess, the war. And right. then also, of course, acting as a barrier to what they perceive as the the Shia crescent. They'll call it the Shia crescent, which is super offensive. Which they but created. From, right, from like uh, Baghdad to Beirut or whatever, or Tehran to Beirut, which is like they think that, you know, that Iran is like moving weapons to Hezbollah through. Well, they are, but, well, yeah, but like they think they can like they stop them. I think they coordinate with the Israelis. Every so often you'll see like the Israelis are suspected of, or sometimes it's the Americans who will bomb close to like the border between Syria and Iraq, because I essentially, they think they're hitting Iranians or Hezbollah, which yeah. sometimes they might be, sometimes they probably aren't. But the point is that I, I suspect that's why they want to maintain that presence. 
Absolutely. Well, if they didn't want a Shia crescent, they shouldn't have knocked over Saddam Hussein. Right. Free. <laughs> right. He was the guy that prevented that. Right. Um, but as far as, you know, starving the people of Syria and depriving the government of its resources, you know, that's the name of the game for humanitarians like Samantha Powers. Mm -hmm. We don't have the capacity um, to, um, to directly implement U.S. policies or U.S. preferences. But what we can do is make sure that your country suffers indefinitely and that your people starve. And it sets an example to show other countries that don't play by our rules. Do you want to be like Yemen? Do you want to have, a, you have all your babies starving and, buy, and, and being born, you know, weighing practically nothing in the hospitals because the mothers are malnourished? Do you want to be completely deprived of access to um, your bank accounts? like the people of Afghanistan just have their money stolen from them, just taken from them. And what given to the, the NYPD or the victims of 9-11 or whatever the hell they did with yeah. it. Yeah. That's what the U.S. can do. We can't win wars. We lost in Iraq, lost in Afghanistan, lost in Syria, lost in Yemen, lost in Somalia, lost in Mali, got displaced by the fucking Wagner group. <laughs> because JSOC did such a piss poor job over there. So we can't win wars, but what we can do is destroy your country and make your people suffer by the millions. And that, like I said, that's a powerful example um, for other countries when they look at their options, countries like Hungary or countries like Georgia. So it's pretty depressing to know that that's the kind of, um, you know, that's the kind of, that's the, the, the game that, that our government is playing our yeah. supposedly democratic government, which isn't democratic because you can't get rid of these people. Nope. Try voting against Victoria Newland. Try voting against people like Jake Sullivan. They're going to be in, in power no matter what. Literally, they have been like repeatedly over and yeah. over again over the past like several decades. Um, and I think that that's probably a good place to end on and to also note that, you know, we are approaching the 20th anniversary of the war in Iraq. Mm. Um, which was one of the greatest crimes of the century and actually could be seen as the starting point for so much of what we just discussed has gone wrong in the Middle East, started mm -hmm. in that war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And you actually, you're, you're a military veteran. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, you know, before we wrap here, what are your thoughts as we approach this 20th anniversary? Um. I mean, I was a college student, but I was in the Army Reserve. I was against the Iraq War from the beginning, before it started. Um, but of course, when you get deployed, so you know the the Iraq War. I what are my reflections on twenty years? Well, there really isn't. It's really not possible to reflect on you know, twenty year anniversary in the same way that you would reflect on like I don't know the 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 pullout from or the fall of Saigon, let's say, because U.S. troops are still in Iraq. Mm -hmm. We're still fighting over there, still in Iraq and Syria. It's the same war. Yeah. Don't forget that the U.S. was uh, penetrating and doing uh, covert actions and overt military actions in Syria from starting in 2003. And that never stopped. It just expanded and expanded, and ramped up and ramped up under both Bush and Obama. Um, there are thousands of troops in Iraq right now. They say, oh, they're just there in an advisory capacity, non-combat capacity. All right, well, why did four Delta Force soldiers get wounded three weeks ago? They play these games where they pretend like, obviously the CIA doesn't exist, so CIA personnel aren't counted. No one talks about what they're doing. Same thing with JSOC, a much more significant organization, military organization, covert military organization, Black Ops. Tons of those guys over there going out and doing unilateral lethal missions on a weekly, if not, a, a day, I don't know if they're on a daily basis, but a near weekly basis, going out and killing Iraqis, going out and killing Syrians. And they say, well, they're ISIS. And maybe in a lot of cases they are, but that's only based on US intelligence, which if there's one overarching lesson from the Iraq war in the last 20 years, it's that US intelligence is worth shit. They <laughs> never had any good intel. They never had any good human intelligence on anything that was happening in Iraq, Syria, or Afghanistan. All we had are names that the Kurds or the Israelis fed them. Mm -hmm. And so they get names from these proxy groups and they go out and kill them. 
and they say they were ISIS. Well, maybe they were, but there's no one there to check their math. It's just based on what they say. So I don't know if that's, I'm sorry for yelling so much. No, you actually didn't raise your voice at all. <laughs> if that's what you think yelling is. Mm. Um, well, I want to thank you for, for spend, David, giving me an hour of your time to, to talk through all this stuff. I think these are all such important and very related topics. And often you won't see a conversation about Ukraine turn into a conversation about Syria and Iraq. And at the end of the day, like all of these wars have a similar thread. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I really, really appreciate you coming on. Can you tell people where they can follow your work? Uh, find me on Twitter. Um, check out my work for Rolling Stone and for Harper's. And uh, I've got a book coming out, but I'm afraid it'll be, be a little while. So. <laughs> All right. Stay well, tuned. we'll keep our eyes out. Thank you so much for coming on. And hopefully we can do this again soon. All right. Thanks a lot, Rania. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you want to see more progressive anti-imperialist content like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with the latest breakthrough news content. And if you want to support our work and get access to exclusive content, head over to patreon.com slash breakthrough news.